All right. Let's see. Let's start with. So we will begin project one on Wednesday. That has a, I think that may just have a, I'm not sure how many materials are in project one. <clears throat> I'll get it posted sometime this evening and need you all to read those materials prior to the start of class on Wednesday uh, so that we can kick that off properly. There should be some Um, a little bit of analysis, if you will, figuring out the problem as we're solving and so forth. Uh, there aren't a lot of materials to read. It would probably take you no more than five or ten minutes to read through it all, but if you could print them out, bring them, that would be good. Midterm. I'm thinking, what am I thinking? Let's see, today's the 24th. March. So today is here. So why don't we say March 5th? What do you think? That sounds good. I'm thinking March, Wednesday, March 5th, 2014. I will provide previous midterms for you to study from. I'll get those posted. I don't know if I'll have time to get it done tonight, but certainly sometime this week. Uh, I should get uh, the midterms posted for you to look at, and then you could certainly feel free to uh, ask me questions at any point between the time I get them posted and, and when the midterm is. Um, so I think that's what's going on in my head right now. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. So it's going to be vellum, paper, paper and pencil? Yeah, just uh, paper and pencil midterm. Uh, yeah, just paper and pencil midterm. Questions on stuff you've been doing? It will not include the material that we are doing on the project. So I think, I think essentially everything on the midterm we've already covered. So over the next week, none of that material is going to appear in the midterm. Mm -hmm. Is it multiple choice or a portion of a multiple choice? Uh, there will probably be a couple questions which are multiple choice. Most of them will be short answer, writing little bits of code. There might be a, a slightly larger coding problem in there. Uh, so one of the, I, I think, the, the key to your success is that all along you've been, when I have in the uh, various assignment directories, kind of the try this on your own type stuff, my motivation for giving that to you is that it has you practicing the same things repeatedly so that when it comes time to doing something like the midterm, you can write a for loop. So as a rhetorical question, I would ask you, are you right now able to write a for loop that prints the numbers from 1 to 10, right? Syntactically correct without looking at any reference. That's the kind of thing that you need to do. So if you've been doing the work, that should be pretty straightforward, right? I'm not asking you to invent some complex program here, just asking you to spit back some simple stuff. There will be a few conceptual questions as well. but. Uh, for those where I need accurate syntax, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, how much time do I have? <clears throat> there are a couple concepts that I, I want to talk about. And by way of introduction, let's say that 
we want to represent a student and that student has a name and that student attends the university that only offers three courses. So they have a physics GPA, a math GPA, and a chem GPA. No computer science at this university. So The question is, how are we going to represent this data inside of an application? And I could, since I need to deal with the name, and the name would go in a string, I'll go ahead and include that. So I can say the string is the name, and I'm going to borrow some of my stuff here. Oops, didn't get any semicolons there. There we go. So that, that information could represent a person. <clears throat> I have a, a bit of an issue, though, in what if I want to represent two people? And I could then I could copy and paste all this. And I could call this name 2, physics GPA 2, math GPA 2, chem GPA 2. Uh, so it, it's starting to look a little kludgy, but that's something I could do. Now, what are some of the tasks that I might have with regards to a person and their information? And uh, even more before any complex things like sorting and uh, that sort. At the basic level, what I want to be able to do is initialize these values, right? And we've done we've written code like this. We've said see out what is the student's name. And then you have a CN statement and you grab the name. What is the student's phys physics? Uh, that I've got these misnamed, don't I? These shouldn't be called GPA. These how about grade, 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 grade. What is the student's physics grade? And then we could go ahead and get that information. I'll do a little copy and paste. So they're taking physics, math, chemistry, trivia. What's the most optimal way for me to change this to say math grade in Vim? Huh? R will replace one character. So what I want to do is I want to do uh, I want to do a command is I want to do C for change. And then uh, if you recall commands want to be followed by a movement. So what I really want to change is if I'm sitting here I want to change from where I'm at up to and including this S in physics. And uh, what I want to look for is a uh, it, whatever is most unique, either the character after it or, the, or that actual character. There are a couple S's in physics, so I would, in a fraction of a second, I would look at this and say, the easiest thing for me to figure out the direction to is the uppercase G. And so what the direction command is T, then letter. So that would be to move cursor to whatever the letter is. So putting it all together, what I want, if I'm sitting on the P in physics, I want to type C at, or excuse me, CTG, change up to but not including the G, and that'll leave me in insert mode. 
So I come here, I type C T G, and I type math, and then I hit escape. And I come here and I say C T G, and this one is chemistry, is that right? Yep. <coughs> and you hit escape. All right. Um, So I guess I should run this a little bit and see if it, you never want to write too much code before you compile. Okay, it doesn't like the fact that I have created these, so I needed the twos at the end of these. All right, I run it. What is the student's name? Ted, physics grade. 0.9, math grade, chem grade, and so it works. <clears throat> if I'm writing a program that's dealing with students generally, then this kind of thing becomes a big hassle. And it, because I don't want to have to repeat this code over and over and over again, and we are advantaged if instead we can put this kind of stuff inside of a function. Okay? And this is similar to the rationale that we had when we were dealing with drawing out that hex paper that I did in class. Over and over again we found code that I was repeating and rather than repeating that code several times over we just take that code, put it up in a function, then whenever we need to run that code we just invoke the function. Okay, So I want to use the same strategy here. And so I'll say from lines 17 to 21, I want to delete them. And I'm going to come up here above main, and I'm going to put them here, and I'm going to call this initialize student. Or I'll just call it initialize. And I want to take uh, now the question. Now we've got a weird kind of problem. Whoops, I didn't. I needed six lines, didn't I? Or more than that, three more, nine lines. All right. This is my function. It's incomplete. I haven't really finished it yet. <coughs> Maybe I make this a void function. <coughs> uh, I have a problem, and that is because of the nature of the way functions work in the language. So if this is the, the information of the student that I want to get initialized, I could call this initialize function, and I could pass in the name and the physics grade and the math grade and the chemistry grade. And what's going to happen is I come up here, then invoke the function. I'm not going to, I'm just going to leave this like this for the moment. The name is going to go in this first variable, the first grade goes in this variable, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, my problem is that this, if you recall, the language has pass by value semantics. So a copy of the name is going to go in here, and a copy of the first three grades are going to go in here. So when I actually change these on line 8 and line 10 and 12 and 14, all I'm changing are these copies here, and I'm not actually doing anything to the information down here. Now there are some interest, some creative ways around it. Uh, let's say for a moment, let's ignore all this stuff for a moment, and let's say all I'm dealing with are names. And so I'm going to actually put that in here. I'm going to say a string nm for the student's name. And I get that. Now I'll comment this out to show that I'm ignoring the fact that it exists for the moment. All right. So we know that nm is its own variable, and that does not change the name. However, what I can do is I can say return nm. Now what kind of thing is nm? So I have to come up here and change this void to a string, since that's the kind of thing I'm returning now. Yes? And now if I make that my function, down here, let me go to my simple version, I would call this initialize function, 
and I pass in the name, and I can do something like that. That would work. <clears throat> but this doesn't work for my situation because we're only allowed to return one thing. We aren't allowed to say, I want to return string and three floats, right? Which is what I, in fact, am trying to fill in in this function. Uh, so we there's a different construct to help us get around these limitations, and it's called a structure. And the idea is, if you have more than one piece of information that tends to be used together, and in this case, this represents a student, so I have four pieces of information, that represent that student, I can actually bundle them together in something called a structure. And the way that looks is I describe what that structure looks like. And the keyword is struct. And I give it a name. I'm going to call it student. And then it's got a set of parentheses and it ends in a semicolon. Okay. Now all I do is I say, what does every student have? And in fact, I'm just going to actually copy and paste what I had down here originally. So if I was looking at lines 5 through 11, I would say, as a programmer, I would say, do you see that there? That is the student structure. Or, that it, or sometimes people will actually parrot this line here and say, oh, that's a struct student. Okay. Do you have a semicolon afterwards? You do have a semicolon afterwards. So I have on lines 6 through 12, here's a, a key idea here, is I have not created anything. I haven't brought anything into existence. At this point in time, all I've done is I've told the compiler, I've told the language something saying, hey, I may want to create a student someday. And if I do create a student, this is what it looks like. Okay? Think of it as a blueprint. By virtue of drawing up a blueprint of a house, you have not created a house. That is what you're doing here. I, I have created a blueprint. Okay? And we have to do something different to actually build a house or to actually create a student. <coughs> and the way you create a student is you simply say the name of what it is student, and give it a name, just like you say integer i. Well, how about student, I don't know, stu. Okay. Now stu is an actual student. And what I can do is uh, take a look at what that actually looks like in memory. So I'm going to open up, whoops, open up uh, my application Sketchbook Express. And we will call this student object. <clears throat> so what are the things that comprise stu? Stu and any other student that I ever create will have a name. So I'm going to take, let's use blue. I'm going to take this much of it and I'm going to say that's the name. I have physics grade, so we'll say it takes up this much. Yeah, I can be better than that. Maybe I can't. All right. Uh, math grade. and chem grade.
all of this together, what is the name of all of this together? Not student. Stu. Student is the blueprint. This whole thing is called Stu. Okay. So if I were now to come down here in my code and I was to create another student, student Stan. Stud, there are no studs in this class. Except for me. But then. <laughs> this is those kind of comments that get my tires slashed, so I better just hush up. Um, so if I create another student named Stan, then what I would do is I'd go through the same thing and I'd say this is the name, this is these are the three types of grades, and then this whole thing is called Stan. Right? Okay. So, do you understand what I'm saying by this is not, when I say that this is not creating anything, that this isn't creating anything? Everyone got that blueprint? Describe something, should we decide to use it? Are you obligated to use it? No, you don't have to use it. There's nothing, there's nothing written in stone that says I have to do lines 32 and 33. If I never create a student at all, that's fine. The compiler doesn't care. We're just providing information for the compiler saying, should I decide to create one of them? This is the structure of it. Now, how do we use it? So I'm going to table this whole function business here for a little bit. Let me see. I'm going to take, I'll take these lines and, uh, do I want to save that stuff? All right, I'll leave it. Sorry, just having a little conversation with myself there. Um, What do I have? All right, I'm going to comment out all of this stuff. We'll get back to that in a little bit. So what I'm left with, I'll grab these two. So this is what I have. I create my student uh, structure, my blueprint, and now I create a couple students. Well, how is it that I now fill in Stu's names, name, physics grade, math grade, and, and chem grade? What you can do is you can say Stu dot name, All right? So the syntax is the name of the variable, a period, and then the, the term I'd use for this is the member. So the, it would be the name member of the student structure. So it's right there. What kind of thing is name? It's a string. We also have physics grade. What kind of thing is physics grade? It's a floating point number and so forth. So there are four members in the student structure. Uh, and lest you get confused, nothing's changed in the world. I can say C out. Oh, let me borrow that code down here. Where is it? It's up here now. This one. I can still use this if I want to. I can say, let me comment that out. What is the student's name? And then what would I put right here? Stu.name. Okay. This kind of stuff works good on an exam. What kind of thing is that? Well, if you can see it. It's a student. What kind of name? is that. What kind of thing is that? Huh? A float. Yeah, a floating point variable. Yes? Line 40 is a student, or a struct student, or a student. Uh, line 42 is a float. All right, was there a question? Did I see a hand go up somewhere? Yeah, but I'm trying to think how I'm going to ask it. Okay. All right, no, no worries. Just let me know. So now let's re-examine our, our initialize function. Instead of passing in a string now, I can pass in a student. No, let's call that S. What is the student's name? S.name. Now let me now I can bring all this code back in.
what is the student's physics grade? I want S's physics grade. I want S's, so let's do this. And this one is math. I'm doing my C to G's, CTG's. This is chem. Now I can use that original trick I did. I can now I can say I want to return S. And what kind of thing is S? Student. That's the thing I'm giving back from the function. Now I come down here and I can create a student stew and I can initialize and I can just pass stew in here. And I'll put this over here. Yes? Yes, because this is the, this right, what do I want, I want to, here we go, there, if you can't, you just got to fool them, that, that is what is being returned, the kind of thing that's being returned, right, yeah, the name of the function, and inputs to function. So initialize the name of the function. Initialize the name of the function. It's arbitrary. Uh, you can call it Jeff if you want to, or Jan, or Josephine, or and we. I could say I could probably go on for some time thinking up names for the function, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one initialize because that's just the way I roll. All right. So that is the, again, like everything up to now, this is the kind of thing being given back to the function. And what that means is if when I have a return statement inside of this function, it better retur be returning a kind of thing that is a student. And I come down here and I see that it's return s. And I ask what kind of thing is s. And I come back up here, aha, s was an input to the function. And it is a student. So I'm golden. Everything matches. Yes? Is this a... Uh, uh structure the same as a record? Uh, structure the same as a record, yes. So some programming languages have this idea of a record and they're conceptually very similar, absolutely. Do you have a question? Called classes, yes. And if I have time, I will talk about classes today. Okay. So uh, this idea of a structure is not new. It exists in the C language. And the idea is that you do have several pieces of data that logically belong together, so you use a structure to bind them together. Now you can write functions that take these structures as arguments, and now you're able to manipulate all these pieces of data inside it. Okay. Uh, I will say for all of you engineers out there that aren't going on to 2.11 and 3.11, the only difference, the only difference between C and C++ at this point is that in the C language, you actually have to use that keyword right there. Wherever I see, I, the C gets confused. It doesn't know what student is, but it knows what a struct student is. Okay? So for you engineers, make a mental note. It's always struct student or struct, whatever you call it. Uh, in C++, they did away with that requirement, so you can actually just name the thing. You don't have to say that it's a structure. Uh, let's 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 try this by golly. You know, let me get rid of some of this stuff. So let's see what code we have. I create my structure. I have this initialize function where it takes a student and gives me back a student. And I ask the questions. So it's good to test this stuff. And there's my line where I'm going to test it right here. So let's see if it works correctly. G++, code.cpp, run it, student's name, Betty, student's physics grade, 3, uh, 3.5, 2.8, whoops, those aren't, that isn't what I wanted, hang on, name, oh, no, I've done it, hang on, name, Betty, uh, <laughs> C++ 
0 0.9. I don't know why I'm struggling with this. 0 0.8 and 0 0.65. Okay, so it looks like it works. Uh, but we want to, mm, let's do more with it. Let's write a function that figures out the average grade. So let's create a function called show average. And this function will take a student. And how do we figure out the average? We create a floating point variable. We'll call it AVE. And we'll set that to zero initially. Always good to initialize these variables I'm going to be using. And I'm going to say that AVE is equal to, how do I figure out the average? What's the average? Add them all up and divide them by how many of them I have. So I have three of them, so I'll divide by three. Yeah? Let's add them all up. Uh, S dot, again, it, I'm just calling this S out of convenience and some semblance of intuition. You can call it anything you want. In fact, let's do that. All right. Uh, FDSA physics grade plus FDSA uh, grade math grade chem grade and we're going to divide the whole thing by three and then I'll do C out the average is AVE, ENDL. All right? I'm not, in this particular version of this particular function, I'm not, whoops, it's a little personal. All right. Um, I'm not giving anything back when I invoke this function, so I put void here. You'll note the absence of any return statements. If I could, but I'd cap it off. I wouldn't provide any information. So we can call that. So let's do uh, stu dot, what was it called? Uh, excuse me. It, uh, show average. I'm going to call this function and I'm going to pass in stew. All right. Shall we try it? So I compile it. I run it. Student's name, <coughs> Missy. Student's physics grade, 0.9, 0.3, 0.8, and the average is two-thirds. Any questions to this point? So, yes? So when you do like FDSA dot physics grade, you can only use that dot to call the specific part of the structure, or can you use it like to call a part of the function? Uh, can you, so you use the dot to call a part of the structure. Can you use it to call a part of the function? Uh, I, I, the answer is the, the dot is only relevant for calling members of a structure. Now, uh, I will show a variant uh, related, something related to the structure, which involves functions. So you'll see something similar to, I think, what you're talking about. But yeah, but, but based on what I've, I've talked about right now, anything, whenever I have a dot, the only thing I can have after the dot are one of these four uh, items right here. Name, physics grade, math grade, chem grade. Any other questions? All right. So there are decades and decades and decades of code written using this idea where you bundle common stuff together using structures and you create functions to have common algorithms that involve these structures. Okay. 
But now, and if you're a, an electrical engineer, this is, this is going to be your bread and butter right here, or one of the engineering disciplines that, uh, where you need some C. So this is your, what you're using day in and day out. For those computer scientists, we move on to something called object-oriented programming. And the way it worked is that uh, they, how do I want to say this? The powers that be were not entirely happy with this layout. And there are a number of philosophical reasons for it. Uh, but let me just say at this point that they want to create a closer marriage between this, uh, using my example right here. Actually, let me use this example down here. Between the show average function and the student. And it's a, it's a reasonable argument on its own. If I asked you, how many times are you going to call the show average function when you're not dealing with students? And you're going to say, that doesn't make any sense at all. You can't even use this function unless you have a student to give it, right? And so they're going to say, that's exactly right. This function is so closely bound to this idea, the structure of student, that we want a construct that actually binds together not only the data that you're working with, but we want to bind together also the functions that operate on this data. So now we have a, a totally new idea, which is I not only list data in here, but I can actually put functions inside here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this, I'm going to rename this. So let me uh, copy code.cpp, we'll call that the struct version. And it was asked, is this similar to what is called a class? And that is exactly right. So the student class. It's not called class. So far, so good. Uh, there is there are two functions that I have. One's called initialize and one is called show average. The initialize function is called initialize. Actually, let me start. Let me start with this one. Then I'll, initialize gets problematic for me to explain. So let me start with show average. Okay. Here is the big semantic leap of faith that really fouls up traditional programmers. So programmers who've been programming in C for decades, and they're like wizards with C, you get to this bit of it, and it really throws them for a loop, and they have a really hard time getting their head around it. Here goes. I took away, what used to be here was this, and the reason I'm taking it away is that we no longer have to provide a student for show average to work on, because show average is able to work directly on this stuff right here. So let me write a little bit of code, and then I'll talk about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste this stuff down here. Oops. All right, you see this FDSA dot stuff? DF dot, DF dot, DF dot. I'm going to write the code and then I'll come back and explain it. Um, <clears throat> I come down to main. I create a student called Stu. Now I want to call the show grade function, stu dot show grade. All right, let me, or excuse me, not show grade, show average. So this right here is the old C style structures. 
this is the this is the new C++ style classes And what I, well, you haven't dealt with initialize yet, but here we'll just say that I'm doing uh, initializing. Assume that Stu is magically initialized for a moment. When I do this right here, show average, it's going to call, come up, and it's going to run this function. And it's going to add up physics grade, math grade, chem grade, and it's going to divide it by three. Whose physics grade, math grade, and chem grade is being added up here? Stu's, not student. Student is a generic, like a, a blueprint. It's not adding up student's physics grade. It's adding up Stu's physics grade. Because I'm calling this function on line 40, excuse me, not 49, on uh, line 55. I say I want Stu to, the way I'd say it is Stu is running the show average function. That's probably how I'd describe that. So when Stu runs the show average function, what happens is Stu's physics grade, math grade, and chem grade are being used in this in these lines right here. And that'll be Stu's average that's printing. Okay. Uh, some of the stuff we need to take as a recipe, so let's look at what I'm doing as the recipe here. I just show the function, what it returns, the name of the function, and any pieces of information it takes. Here I'm writing the function just like I always write functions. I do have this additional bit of syntax sugar. And what I, if I don't have this here, then C++ thinks this is a traditional normal function like we've been doing up to today. By providing this information, we're telling the compiler this is a special function. It's a function that's part of the student class described on lines 6 through 13. So what I want you to do, I still have to give you the word of the day, so don't pack it in yet. Uh, what I want you to do is I'm going to get this stuff posted. I'm going to write out the initialize function, and I'm going to post it. And I want you to download this stuff and, and try compiling it and running it. Uh, take a second look at it before Wednesday, all right? It's really weird because Java can be very similar thing to something dot something. Yes. Everything in Java is exactly the same except this code right here. In Java, I would put right here. I'd actually put it inside the description of the class. And you can do that in C++, uh, but for reasons we won't go into, the preference in C++ is to separate, separate out the description of these functions. Yes? Uh, how can you declare the function after you put it in the class? Uh, in fact, you have to do it that way because it's this line on line 12 that tells the compiler that the class student has a show average function. So when it sees this, it goes, aha, this, you must be describing the show average function that's in the student class that you described above. If you do it the other way around and I put this above, then it says, whoa, whoa, I don't have the slightest idea what student is. Okay, so uh, I specifically did want to put it below. Did we already do pecant? Yeah, we did. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Hang on. <laughs> Got to get into my secret tool chest here. Uh, oh, man. Where did I put that? Um, I, I, oh, man. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, it's there. Okay, the word of the day is, wait for it, Monday, week six. Desideratum, <clears throat> or if plural, desiderata. <clears throat> and I should have that secret word quiz already up and visible, so if you have a computer in front of you, you should be able to submit it right this minute. 
So I'll work hard to make sure that that's the case moving forward. All right. Uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Again, keep your eyes out for the posting of the project. I would like you to print out and read through those materials and bring them to class on Wednesday.